Welcome to the video recordings of Lancaster Brethren in Christ Church, located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. LBIC is a community being transformed by the love of Jesus, sharing this love with all people. Our desire is for this online video content to be an extension of our community, allowing for a visual and more personal connection with familiar voices, helping us think about how to follow Jesus in our particular moment. So enjoy the video, and we hope to see you soon in person. Morning, Lancaster Brethren Christ Church. Welcome to another Sunday service and a beautiful morning. I invite you to stand. Let's welcome the presence of God here.
You may be seated. It's so good to see all of you this morning as we continue on our weekly gathering of worshiping together in the gym in a couple weeks. In uh, mid-May, we'll move outside, but for now we're going to keep meeting here in the gym for a while. But today's going to be a little bit more unique than usual in that um, Pastor Joshua had a family member who contracted COVID. And so that means it means that he is quarantining last week and this week. So this week he'll be preaching to us via Zoom. He's We have a little camera on so he can watch the worship that's going on up here right now. And um, then when it's time for him to preach... He will do that via Zoom. So we're we're just, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for our tech team, for everybody who's been able to kind of shift and move with this. And um, his family's doing well. The one who had COVID is, is recovered well and doing fine. And everybody else has had no symptoms. So um, that that's okay. Um, but yeah, we're just going to keep him safe for another week. So um, would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin our time of worship together? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we can worship together, and thank you that we can even do it in unique ways. Um, Joshua preaching through Zoom, and we know we still have many families that are that are watching our service through Zoom or online or, or the different technology options that we have. I'm thankful for them, Lord. Um, they have been a way that we've been able to stay connected over this past year. So we thank you for that. As we as we get our hearts and our minds turned towards this service and this time together, Lord. Would you minister to each one of us? Would you lead us to think and receive and be blessed in the ways that you want each one of us as individuals to do, in the wonderful, mysterious way that you speak to each one of us as individuals in this corporate time together? Please continue to do that today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we sing our next song, we are going to say Psalm 23 together. So it will be on the screen behind me. So let's read this together. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. We're going to sit in that last verse for a little bit. Um, Surely goodness and love, your goodness, God, and love will follow me all the days of my life. Um, the goodness of God is evident in our lives. It's evident in the way that God interacts in uh, the Bible and history. Uh, and we're going to recognize that. We're going to remember that in our worship. And we're going to commit ourselves again and put our trust in him. So let's stand and, and worship. You have led me through the fire 
in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendering now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness your goodness is running after it's running after me and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. Fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good good Never gonna let me down. You 
through our highs and lows, you are always faithful and you are with us. Lord, help us in all things to put our trust in you, in good and bad, knowing that you are with us and that you will sustain us and give us the strength. We declare our trust in you again, Lord. Come, thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Until now thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place. And I know thy hand will bring me safely home by taught me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious love Alleluia 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 The scriptures tell us to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Next Sunday, we will be rejoicing with those who rejoice as we celebrate our seniors who will be graduating this year. So we just look forward to that day that we can honor and really celebrate those seniors. But today we want to also um, mourn with those who mourn as we recognize that um, one of our brothers, Ed Brainerd, passed away on April 14th. 
Many of you would know Ed, but for those of you who don't, I wanted to read just a little portion of his um, obituary because it's a great way to know a little bit about who Ed was. Listen to what it says about Ed. Ed was a, Bible, a biblical scholar, a devoted husband, a playful father and grandfather, a school bus driver, a Sunday school teacher, pastor, missionary, proofreader, and IT guy. He was known for his talent, wit, and humor. He was a performer, a musician, a lyricist. He sang, directed choirs, played the trumpet and the baritone. He wrote songs, sermons, plays, and musicals. He was a very talented man. And if you knew him, you would know music was the thing that I really knew that Ed just loved. And so we want to extend our sympathies to Kathy and her family as they continue on as they grieve the loss of Ed. So would you join me as we pray together for this family? Lord Jesus, we want to pause and we want to thank you for Ed. Thank you for his life. Thank you for the many gifts, talents, and abilities you gave to him. And thank you that you gave him the opportunities through worship, through music, through preaching, a number of different opportunities you gave him, not only to use his talents, but to ex express his love for you. At this time, Lord, we do want to lift up Kathy and her family as they continue to grieve. We ask, Lord, that you would be a source of comfort and strength and help and peace for them as they continue to mourn and think of it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week, you'll remember that Ethan and Jonathan both spoke about Pastor Joshua. Ethan remind, or let us know that Joshua has signed on for another five years as our senior pastor, for which we're very thankful. And Joshua began to talk to us about it, well, what it means for Jonathan talked to us about what it means for Joshua to go on sabbatical. And I wanted to just expound on that a little bit more. What will it look like for us in the 12 weeks that Joshua is on sabbatical? It's not just an opportunity for Joshua to get rest and renewed. Well, it is that. And it's a great opportunity for him to model to us what it means to take advantage of God's command to rest. But it's also a great opportunity for us as a church body as a church family to come together and to use some of our gifts and our abilities. One of the things that I'm really excited about is that there will be a number of different speakers over those 12 weeks. I will preach a couple times, but not every week. And um, except for the bishop of our conference, Bishop Brian Hoke, except for him, everybody else who speaks is people from our own church family, which I think is just fantastic that we get to hear from other voices. It's a great for chance for some of you who may be newer, or maybe not. Maybe you've been coming here a long time and you've never heard some of these other voices speak. So I'm just really excited about how we'll be able to hear from other people during that time. It will also be an opportunity for us as a church family to maybe step into some roles that we've never done before. And that can be as relaxed or as structured as you may feel led. It could be as simple as just being more intentional about greeting people as you see them come in on a Sunday morning or reaching out to people that you haven't seen for a while on a Sunday morning. It could be much more structured like serving in youth or children or home church or worship ministries. Or it could be anything like setting up and tearing down on a Sunday morning. The possibilities are endless. But what this time is, is a time for us to fill in any gaps that may be there by Joshua not being here, but also stepping into other roles that Joshua doesn't typically lead youth group, but that doesn't mean we can't step into a new role during that time and get involved. It's a great time for us to just see where the Lord is leading us to serve in his church family. One thing I do want to share about this time is that we want to do this 100%. And what I mean by that is that we are not going to contact Joshua for three months. So, if you have a question or need something, you may contact me, Pastor Brian, Pastor Kira, a member of leadership team, but not Pastor Joshua. If you want to talk about something you heard in a sermon, you can contact me, Pastor Brian, Pastor Kira, anyone on leadership team, but not Pastor Joshua. If you come up with a great idea of something our church should do in the next who knows when, you may contact me, Pastor Brian, Pastor Kira, anyone on leadership team, but not Pastor Joshua. I think you get the point. The way that we want to honor him and honor the sabbatical is by doing it 100%. We don't want, as Jonathan said, we don't want to just leave a bunch of stuff for him for when he gets back. We want to be the church, and we can do that while he's away for three months. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy for us. 
we'll hit some stumbling blocks for sure. It doesn't actually even mean it's going to be easy for him, but it is what we're called to do, and so we are just going to rally together and do it 100%. Two things that we can do during the sabbatical that we are invited to do. One is that you may have noticed that there was a table of books over there. Pastor Joshua, one of the things he's going to be doing is some reading while he's away, and he has invited us to join him in reading the um, autobiography or biography of Eugene Peterson. We have 10 copies of the book, and some of them might be gone by now, but what we'd like you to do is take one of the books, sign it out, read it, bring it back, put it on the table for somebody else to take home and read it so that we can all be reading one book together over the summer. If you do take it home, read it, and bring it back, put your name in the front cover so we can kind of keep track of who, who else has also read this book. Um, so we encourage you to do that. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to have some picnics. On the second Sunday of the month in June, July, and August, we're just going to have a picnic after church on the church lawn. You bring your own food. We're, not, we're going to try to keep it as pandemic safe as possible so we're not serving food bring your own food and it'll just it's not going to be organized it's just a time to share a meal together we'll actually do it in may also but that will be on may 16th because the second sunday in may is mother's day so do your mom thing that day but then may 16th and then the second sundays in june july and august we're just going to have a picnic together outside just as a way to connect and reconnect as we start to gather together I believe that's all the announcements I had, and so let's just pause for a moment of prayer. Oh, wait, before we pray, let's let the kids go. Children, you may go. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship, to listen to your word, to be ministered to. I pray that in this time you would just flow through the words that Joshua has that it is your voice that you are speaking to us today. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. All righty. Well, hey everybody. Uh, this is not how I would want to be with you on uh, the second Sunday before I leave for three months. Um, but life doesn't always work out like we would want it to. And so, yeah, earlier this past week, uh, we found out one of our household uh, had, had COVID. It was not me, but um, nobody else had symptoms or anything like that. But just in terms of trying to keep folks safe or whatnot, um, we've been quarantining. And so everybody's in their own section of the house. And it's, it's been a different kind of week. Um, yeah, and so any other time, uh, I, <laughs> I would not come to you via screen. Jonathan Bowman was ready to, uh, to, to be live and to, to speak uh, today for me. But, um, yeah, just in, in light of going on sabbatical uh, the week after next, I uh, wanted to be with you again here today. So um, I'm glad and grateful that we have the technology to be able to do this and, and um I'm glad to be with you in sort of a live sort of way. I can see a few of the back of your heads, but but not everybody. But um, so uh, as, as we begin today, one of the things I just want to remind us is um, of is that when we come together, I want to encourage you to just bring uh, the stuff of your life into the sanctuary of God, this place that is symbolic, but yet reminds us that God dwells with us, even if it's in a gym, and even if we're meeting over Zoom, um, that we bring whatever uh, is going on in our life to God, um, that our faith is grounded in the reality of what is happening in our lives. And so um, as we begin this morning, what I'd like to invite you to do is just to bring to the forefront of your minds and of your hearts what's going on in your life. And it could be across uh, the spectrum. Uh, and, and as you think about those things, I'll, I'll bring some things uh, that's going on in my life. And then as we all bring these uh, things to the forefront together, uh, we want to hear and receive the scripture in the midst of that. So uh, obviously COVID is, is in the forefront of our minds and we've been dealing with the wonkiness uh, this week of being in the same house, but yet not really being able to spend much time together. And so that's just relationally kind of uh, weird. Um, but there are other things too, uh, as, as I've just looked and as you've looked probably too about what's uh, happening in the world, uh, I, I think of the uh, the shortage of oxygen in India and and the discrepancy and the disparity between nations and how 
um, we are able to deal with uh, this pandemic in, in different ways. Um, I think of justice being done in the conviction of George Floyd's murder last week. And at the same time, I think of the emptiness of a soul who could do such a thing. And I also think of a long road ahead of us that we have in this nation towards equality and recognizing the humanity in, in every person. I also think of dear friends of ours uh, who their family is just going through a very complicated um, journey and time in their life and the decisions that they have to make. And so, uh, and, and at the same time, uh, I also bring the fact that we can be here together today uh, and we can bring ourselves to God. Um, and so there's a lot that I bring with me and, and probably there's a lot uh, that you bring with you too. And in the midst of all of that, what I want to invite us to do is to hear this psalm again that's presented to us, this psalm that we're very familiar with. But I want us to hear it and kind of let it wash over us in the place where we are and in what we're bringing today. So hear this Psalm 23 one more time and think about it and hear it in the place that you are. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing or I lack no thing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Sometimes when we hear this psalm, we associate it with a place, and this place is serene, it's peaceful, there's green pastures, there's quiet waters, there's a soul that's restored. And in reading this psalm, sometimes we might think that the goal is to find this kind of place for ourselves. And the truth is that many of us can, uh, whether you're in the city or the suburbs in Lancaster County, there are a a ton of beautiful places, County Park being one of them. And actually between services, I was catching Branch and Vine a little bit of their service. They're meeting in County Park, our sister church, the church plant that we support in Lancaster City. Uh, they're meeting in Lancaster County Park today. Um, but for, for all of us, we have this place, this beautiful place at County Park and, and the Conestoga River that flows through it. And we could uh, find that kind of serene and peaceful place there. Uh, other folks in the world um, can go a step farther and maybe buy themselves this kind of experience. They can buy an all-inclusive uh, to wherever they want to go with fine foods and tours and beaches and, and, and whatever. Um, and so some, some people have the good fortune of kind of buying themselves this Psalm 23 serene sort of place. But what's interesting is whether you're on the shores of the Conestoga River or you're able to do other things, um, you can be in a peaceful place and still not be at peace. You can be in a peaceful place and still not kind of inhabit uh, what this psalm is describing. And that's because Psalm 23 isn't about, uh, it, it's not a psalm of place, but it's a psalm of presence. It's not a psalm of place, but it's a psalm of presence. If there is a sense of place in the psalm, the place is wherever you are. And that's why I invited us to um, think about what we're bringing to today, to this time together today, because God meets us where we are. We don't have to go and find this place. We don't have to go and find this place of, of serenity uh, that David is describing metaphorically as his relationship with God. Um, but that place is where we are. So wherever you are, God is. It's not a place that you have to find, but it's a presence that you and I are invited to receive. I'd like us to think a, a few minutes about the writer of the psalm and the writing of it. Uh, there's, there's a vein of, of Christianity or a way of thinking uh, Christianly that idealizes a life of faith and separates it completely from the everyday um, so it becomes unrooted and ungrounded. And for me, this is a dangerous version of Christian faith because it tries to ignore the present reality in exchange for an idealized one. So this kind of, this kind of way of thinking um, might read this psalm and might 
picture, you know, David just sunbathing by uh, the Euphrates or the Jordan River, playing his harp, all the sheep just cuddling around him and keeping him warm or whatever. And, and, and you might get this picture of, oh, wouldn't it be just great to be a shepherd? Like, isn't this just the place where we want to be? But life as a shepherd isn't that simple. And throughout David's life, we find that shepherd life and, and where he wrote this actually wasn't such a peaceful and serene place at all. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, there's this exchange between David and Saul, and David is describing his life as a shepherd to Saul before he's going to go and, and meet Goliath in the battlefield. And this is what David says to Saul. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. He's a shepherd. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from a flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. What we don't want to do is idealize the life of a shepherd because being a shepherd is a difficult life. It's a lonely life. Uh, for David, um, just familiarly speaking, being the last of, of Jesse's sons, uh, he was the one who was sent off into the fields to tend the sheep. He was kind of giving, given the most thankless and, and meaningless job in, in the family. And as we read in the selection of David as king, Samuel shows up as a prophet, asks Jesse to bring all his sons. Jesse doesn't even think to bring David, but he, he lines up the others. And uh, they're more impressive than David is. David's the one that's chosen, but it just goes to kind of show you his place within the family. That place of being a shepherd wasn't a place that was esteemed to be. He was forgotten. He was out in the fields by himself. And he would spend nights and days and nights and days out there. It was a lonely place. It wasn't just a lonely place where he was alone, but the company that he did keep, not only with the sheep, but the threat of of attack was very, very real. And so there were lions, there were bears, there's jackals in that area of the world. And, and he would have to keep alert to protect the sheep from all of these things. And so it's in that kind of scenario and situation, that kind of backdrop that David writes this psalm. He doesn't come to writing the psalm because he's describing the serene nature of his occupation. He's not idealizing the occupation of a shepherd. He writes this psalm because this is who God revealed God's self to be in the nights of loneliness and threat. That is the place where this psalm comes out of. Now, David could have also written the psalm later in his life, too. He could have used he could have used uh, his, his time as a shepherd to reflect back on and meditate on God's presence in his life currently, um, as he reflected back on being a shepherd, because David really, his, his, his life was one of, of continued conflict. And so maybe he wrote the Psalm as Saul was throwing spears at him and he was reflecting back on how God protected him in the past to ensure and remind himself, and remind his soul of how God's going to protect him in the present. So maybe it was when Saul was throwing spears at him, or maybe it was when it, he was on the run, when he had no food, maybe it was when his son Absalom, his own, his own son turned against him, tried to kill him, tried to take his throne. Could have been any one of these things. Either way, the point is this, is that David doesn't just, he's not just strumming a harp out in the middle of this beautiful green field. It is a truth of his experience of God that comes to him in the reality of his life. And so that's what I want to to help us understand today is this life of God very literally comes to David in the valley of the shadow. As we mentioned last week, because uh, we, we talked about a psalm last week as well, and one of the things that I mentioned there, and it's good to remind ourselves too, that Jesus read these psalms too. 
he read them with with regularity. And one of the interesting things that the uh, one of the commentators uh, remarked about this last week, he just posed this idea: What if Jesus prayed Psalm 23 on the way to the cross? Now, did he? We don't know. Um, but that doesn't really matter because it does help us to use our imagination for how Jesus might have prayed this. Um, it, it helps us to visualize this psalm that we know so well being prayed from a different place. And so imagine a, a betrayed and bloodied Jesus with a heavy wooden cross over his shoulder, praying this to his father as he labored up the Golgothan hill. Okay, so let's hear the psalm again. And let's just imagine Jesus praying it from this place. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So David sang this song as a response to the presence and the work of God in his life amidst the lions and the jackals and the lonely nights. Jesus prayed this prayer too, maybe not, maybe not on the way to Golgotha, but certainly as he prayed this prayer, he did it as he was rejected by the Pharisees, as he was confronting and delivering people from demons and from spiritual powers that were oppressive. He, he did this as um, he brought about the kingdom of God in a way that nobody imagined. He would be praying this prayer. And so here's what I want to invite us to think about today. Think about those times when you battled the lonely nights, your own version of, of lions and jackals, of being a shepherd maybe, your feelings perhaps of being dismissed, whether it be by, by family or by people or positions of authority or by systems, um, whatever it may be, imagine just being dismissed. But how did God, how has God become real to you in those times? Because Psalm 23 is an expression of David um, articulating how God became real to him through the life that he knew so well as a shepherd. He knew that life. It wasn't a hypothetical sort of life. He was expressing how he came to know God through his very life. What song might you write or what words might you use to express your experience of God's presence during those times? Like for David, if he wrote it earlier in his life, he's falling back on these words. Those words that were real to him are real to him again. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's good for us to remember, and we'll have the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. It's good for us to remember those times that God was active in our lives because it acts as a foundation and a place to stand when we need to remind ourselves that God still is active in our lives. If you haven't ever done this, maybe you want to take uh, one of the most poignant times that you have had in your life with God, where it was just an undeniable time where God met you and, and, and maybe spoke to you or just showed up in your situation. And it might be good for you just to reflect on that and write about it. Maybe write your own psalm. Take some time this week to write your own psalm. Uh, expressing the reality of, of God being with you, just as David did in this one. And use that as a reminder um, and, and as kind of a testimony to your own self and maybe to others of, of God's faithfulness in the present through the experience, the real lived experience of your life. All of us, I think, uh, in one degree, or another, we all experience these lonely nights, uh, perhaps some overwhelming darkness or what feels like threats on every side. But here's my encouragement today. Instead of idealizing this psalm and saying, oh, this is a beautiful picture in a beautiful place, how does the reality of this psalm meet you in the midst of those places? 
in the midst of the places of the valleys of the shadows of death, in the places of threat, in the places of loneliness. How can this scripture, how can Psalm 23 act as food for your soul, as nourishment for your soul in the midst of these difficult places? So with all of this in mind, I'd like to pray this psalm again. Uh, I want to pray it for you and with you. And I want to invite you to pray it where you are. Pray it with your feet firmly planted in the life as you are living it and experiencing it now, in the world as it is right now. Pray it as presence. Pray it as a proclamation. Pray it as promise. Maybe as we pray it this final time, we can pray it for someone. Maybe there's someone that you're carrying in your heart uh, that you can pray this for, where God would just meet them in the reality of where they are. But let's pray the psalm again. I just want to invite you to close your eyes and receive uh, the words of David and the psalmist again and, and receive the presence of God uh, with us where we are right now. Let's pray together. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. He makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside quiet waters. He refreshes our soul. He guides us along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though we walk through the darkest valley, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint our heads with oil, our cups overflow. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. I was with you guys in person, and if there wasn't COVID, this would be kind of one of those days where um, it would be good to anoint one another and just remind one another that God is present with us where we are. And so even though we can't do that, I just want to remind us that the Lord is with us. The Lord is with you. Um, love you all. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, it's good to be with you in this way today. Thanks, Joshua. And as uh, we have just prayed in Psalm 23, um, I invite you to let God speak to you in this time as, as, another, uh, as a song is played. Just receive God's word and, and listen for him.
called you, called you by name. Your labor is not in vain. The houses you labor to build will finally with laughter and joy be filled. The serpent that hurts and destroys will be killed, and all that is broken be healed. For I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, you. for I have called you, called you by name. Your labor is not in vain, for I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, for I have called you, called you by name, your labor As we prepare to receive the Lord's communion this morning, would you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. After supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is a new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us receive together. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that we can take this communion as a remembrance of your death and your resurrection, of the covenant that you've given to us, your promise of love and forgiveness and grace. And we can do that on the heels of singing of a living God who says, I am with you. We remember what you did and we remember who you are. And we thank you for both of these amazing things. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand. Never folk can follow 
for you this week is that you will stay upon Jehovah, that your heart will be fully blessed, and as Jesus promised, you will find peace and rest. May you go in peace. Mm -hmm.